Good evening, everyone. Today is Monday, March 17th, 18th. Oh my gosh, I am still in my celebratory mood from yesterday. Today is Monday, March 18th. Thank you. Um, I will call this meeting to order of the RTM with 70 members out of 100 present. Before I hand it over to your moderator, I'd like to introduce the newest member of the RTM, voted in in District 1. If Charlie Powers would rise, he's our newest member of the RTM. As a public service announcement, um, District 3 is winding up its search for one open spot. So if anyone listening or the audience here knows of anyone in District 3, please reach out to Beth Lane and get the information to her. And with that, I'll turn it over to Seth Morton. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Uh, I asked um, the Rules Committee if they would allow me to take a moment to uh, remember Virgil Wenger, who passed on February 12th at the age of 93. He served this body and the town with distinction from 1995 until 2009. Uh, he retired as a senior partner at Ernst & Young in 1990, and then he brought his talents to the RTM. He served uh, with me on the board of fi on the on the uh, finance and budget committee, and his analytical abilities came to the fore around budget time in spades. He was a very sharp analyst. Um, <clears throat> even better, he was really a great guy. He was always able to make his points while keeping things civil. So we will miss Virgil Wenger and I ask for a moment of silence in his honor. Thank you. <clears throat> the agenda tonight, uh, we will have to modify a little bit. There is really nothing more to say on Great Island. I spoke to, with Monica McNally earlier this week, and I said, you know, do you want to come in and give an update? Adeletta's out in Phoenix. At any rate, um, <laughs> so, um, so she said no, that uh, she thought she did a pretty good job the last time, so we'll, uh, we'll put it off for the next meeting. Um, also, uh, item 2414 is not ready. Um, the, we would have had to vote the 850 uh, before the Board of Finance did, and uh, I got a, a mild tap on the wrist about that from town council who said, you can't do that. Oh, okay. So uh, that, yeah, we'll pull 850, the 850, and, and then we'll see where it goes. So um, the next uh, item really on the agenda is approval of the minutes of February 26. Uh, do I have a motion favor, please? So moved. Thank you, Jim, <laughs> as always. Uh, second? Thank you, thank you Liz. Um, <clears throat> any corrections, additions, deletions? Seeing none. Uh, all those in favor of accepting, uh, approving the minutes of February 26, say aye. Aye. Opposed? I hear none. No abstentions. Thank you. Motion, the minutes stand approved. <clears throat> Next item is uh, item 2418, uh, the 20 Great Island uh, Road uh, lease, and speaking on behalf of uh, Planning, Zoning, and Housing, Amy Zabatakis. Good evening, Amy Zabatakis, District 5 Chair of RTM Planning, Zoning, and Housing Committee. 
I move resolution 2418, approving the lease of the premises known as 20 Great Island. Do I have a second? Thank you. Without objection, I'll waive reading of the resolution. On March 7th, the Planning, Zoning, and Housing Committee held a meeting with 10 members of our 14-person 14 14 committee present, representing a quorum. Um, as background on the leases, in July of 2023, this body approved the lease of stable apartment 46A with a monthly rent of $5,500. And the RTM further voted to extend this lease last month. During that same meeting last month, um, Selectman McNally spoke to us and um, informed the, the body that the stable was go not going to be, the stable tenant was going to be moving out at the end of February. And with that stable tenant what went one of the residential stable apartments because they were rented by the same body. So then that left just the one residential tenant in the stables. And um, as Spilek McNally explained last month, it, we, can, we don't need to pay as much for utilities if we don't have anyone in that building. So it was requested that the remaining residential tenant, the one in 46A, relocate elsewhere on the island. Um, so this tenant will be moving into 20 Great Island, which is the lease that we're approving. That unit was previously unoccupied um, and it will be at the same rent as was being paid for 46A, um, the 5,500. Um, we, the committee agreed that this relocation makes sense and uh, voted unanimously in favor of the lease for 20 Great Island. Um, I should say the terms of the 20 Great Island are, lease are identical to all of the leases that the RTM has previously approved. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, speaking on pa behalf of Public Works, I'll get you next, Jenny. <laughs> Frank, Frank Edelman, thank you. Thank you, Seth, and thank you, Amy. Good evening, I'm Frank Edelman. I'm the chair of District 6 and the vice chair of Public Works. As Seth mentioned, Mark is traveling today and unable to be here this evening, so I'll speak. I'm reporting on our committee's work in his place. The Public Works Committee met on Thursday, March 7th, here at Town Hall with 12 of 15 members present, comprising a quorum. We also reviewed and discussed the proposed property lease for 20 Great Island. Uh, Amy did a great job summarizing that. I won't repeat the points she covered. I do want to emphasize a few things that we did discuss, that uh, the terms of the leases all do align, so this, uh, pro this property will be in, in, uh, on the same cycle as all the other properties on the island. Uh, as with the other leases, even though this is nominally for 13 and a half months, both the town and the tenant each have the right to cancel the lease on 90 days notice. So if there's a pressing reason that we need to reclaim that property for any reason, like with all the others, we're able to do that. Um, and because the tenant is relocating from a different structure to just to the new unit, we're not recruiting a new tenant to the site. Uh, at a high, at a strategic level, this lease is in line with the comments we made at our last meeting, specifically that the town is working through the Great Island Advisory Committee, and it's continuing to develop, to develop a long-term strategy about Great Island, including the question of whether the town wants to continue to act in the role of a landlord by leasing residential property to private individuals with all the obligations that entails. This question is still open, pending hiring of a consultant and further deliberation by the GIAC. So this lease, like the ones we approved last month, will generally maintain the existing status quo, status quo arrangements, but are not intended to signal that these properties will continue to be leased for the long term. With 12 of 15 members present, the Public Works Committee voted unanimously to approve this lease. There were no dissents or any controversial issues to report, and we recommend that the full RTM approve these items. Okay, speaking on behalf of Finance and Budget Committee, Jenny Schwartz. Um, Jack sends his regrets. <laughs> I am not Jack Davis. Uh, I am Jenny Schwartz from District 1. Um, I sit on the Finance and Budget Committee and I'm the clerk. Uh, thank you, Amy and Frank, for those reports. Uh, as previously reported, the monthly lease payments are 5500 a month or uh, 66,000 annually. This is the same amount as the tenant pays 
for their apartment in the stable. The lease is the same as the prior leases approved, except for there is a rider on the second fireplace. The RTM Finance and Budget Committee voted unanimously in favor in approving this lease at 20 Great Island Road and recommends the same to the full RTM. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. <clears throat> Any other reports, committees? No? Anything from uh, town officials? No. Anybody, questions from the body? Okay. Electors of the town? See none. So looks like we're ready to vote. All in favor, please rise. Thank you. And then, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is not a good idea. Is it? Uh, opposed? Yeah, I see no uh, abstentions. Okay. Okay, I think we can go ahead and keep going. Uh, <clears throat> next item is 24-15, Advisory Commission on Coastal Waters, a special appropriation to dredge Darien Harbor. Speaking on behalf of uh, <coughs> uh, the Park and Recreation Commission, uh, Committee, uh, Patty Baumgartner. Good evening and happy St. Patrick's Day plus one. We're repping the green here, in case you missed it. Uh, if we'd known it was such a short meeting, Seth, we might have called a uh, required go to the goose after this. <laughs> Next time. It's not a new idea. <laughs> uh, my name is Patty Finn Bumgardner, and I'm District One and RTM Parks and Rec Committee Vice Chair. And this uh, report is prepared by our chair, Adele, who is sick and couldn't be here today. Um, I'd like to move 2415 resolution of the representative town meeting um, of Darianne to consider appropriating $26,500 for the cost of consult, cons, consult, sorry, consultation services to, to assist with the dredge planning and permitting services for a proposed dredging project of the navigation channel in Darien Harbor. Do I have a second? Second. Alyssa? With no objection, I'd like to weave, uh, read the wave, I'd like to waive the reading of the resolution. And I haven't even had a Guinness. <laughs> this is, a, I'm last minute stepping in here, so bear with me. Um, on behalf of the town, the Advisory Commission on Coastal Waters, um, ACCW, has ensured that professional surveys are conducted on a triannual basis since 2012, except during COVID, to determine the navigability of the Darien Harbor Channel. This part of the channel lies closest to the Long Island Sound and was not included in testing done for the Pear Tree Beach Project. Since 2001, the ACCW has used Marine Consultant Coastline Consulting and Development, LLC, in Bradford, Connecticut, to conduct and coordinate their dredging-related services, including hydrographic surveys and permitting. The Darien Harbor Channel was last dredged by Coastline in 2001 to an eight-foot depth at mean low water so MLW as they call it, which was necessary in order to keep the harbor operational and safe. Darien's Harbor is home to over 500 boats of all kind. In April 2023, Coastline undertook a hydrographical survey funded jointly by the Neurotin Yacht Club, the Darien Yacht Club, the Darien Boat Club, it should say, but the Darien Boat Club and town that indicated that there's been on average about two feet of channel silting, reducing the depth to six feet at mean water low, 
mean low water. So it was eight feet, now it's down to six feet depth at mean low water. And that's 9,668 uh, cubic yards of silt. There's been some complaints of near grounding at low tide at various shallow locations. It's clear the town will need to dredge in the near future in order to keep our harbor viable and our boaters safe. In 2023, survey, in the 2023 survey detected an almost doubling of silt from the three previous surveys. The accelerated fill rate is possibly due to downriver filling or storms and spotlights the need to expedite the maintenance dredging process. This special appropriation will fund the engagement of Coastline for the development of dredging plans and applications for maintenance dredging permits from the Connecticut Deep and the Army Corps of Engineers. Coastline Consulting and Development LLC fixed fee is 15,900 and 95. These fees are based on the following schedule and assumptions. So I'm going to describe the scope of the work and then the fees. So sampling and analysis plan is 3,925. Sediment coring and sample collection is 4,120. Sediment lab testing is 9,000. That's an estimate. Application drawings is 3,850. And state and federal permit is 4,100. In addition to the fixed fee paid to Coastline, an application fee paid directly for the maintenance dredging permit is typically about $375 plus a recording fee of $60. These are not hard figures until negotiations with the Connecticut Deep and the Army Corps of Engineers are completed and fees determined, which have been escalating. Currently, the permitting process is taking two years. Once the approvals have been obtained, the project must be initiated within five years. Dredging costs beyond the permitting expense for removal of 10,000 cubic yards, non-toxic material at today's price is estimated by Coastline to be $350,000. Further costs at the time of actual dredging will be developed based on the actual amount of sediment to be removed, dumping locations available for the makeup of the material, as well as any increase in barge dredge removal costs. The most important factor is the makeup of the sediment. In 2001, the Commission successfully formed a private, public-private partnership with Darien Boat Club Neroten Yacht Club and our town to fund the dredging portion of the project. The Board of Selectmen voted to approve the special appropriation request on February 5, 2024, and the Board of Finance approved the $26,500 on February 13th. The RTM Parks and Rec Committee met on March 6, with 11 of, 17, 11 of 17 members present, constituting a quorum, and voted unanimously and supported the special appropriation for $26,500 for dredge planning and permitting services to conduct maintenance dredging of Darien Harbor. We urge the RTM to do the same. Thank you. Great, <laughs> Now speaking on behalf of the Finance and Budget Committee, Jenny Schwartz. I'm Jenny Schwartz, District 1, Finance and Budget Committee Clerk. Uh, thank you, Patty and Adele, for putting that report together. It's excellent. Not much to add here. Not much to repeat. Um, this is a special appropriation from Fund Balance to hire Coastline Consulting and Development to perform preliminary testing and to apply to the CT Deep and the Army Corps of Engineers to determine the extent of the dredging, the, ter the determination of the level of environmental toxins, and the application fee to the state to allow for the dredging. The process to obtain a permit is taking two years, and work must begin within five years of approval. Uh, Adele and Patty, uh, you, you've covered pretty much all the costs, um, but to characterize them in groupings, Coastline Consulting uh, fixed fee is $15,995, state and federal permit applications $4,100, dredging permit and recording $435, 
and other cost estimates and contingency, $5,970. The final cost for dredging is not yet determined until the testing is complete. The RTM Finance and Budget Committee voted unanimously to approve this resolution and recommends the same to the full RTM. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Jenny. Nice filling. Are there any other reports from committees? Okay, remarks from town officials? See none. Questions from the body? Anything from town electors? I see none. Looks like we're ready to vote. All those in favor, please rise. Item 2418 passed, said 70 in favor, one abstention. Opposed, please. Abstentions? See none, okay. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda is 2416, revision of part four, section three, appendix B, rules of procedure. Speaking on behalf of the town government structure and administration committee, Frank Kemp. My name is Frank Kemp, District 4, and Chairman of the RTM Government Structure and Administration Committee. I move RTM Resolution 2416, a resolution by the representative town meeting of the town of Darien to amend Appendix B, Part 4, Section 3 of the Rules of Procedure of the representative town meeting. Is there a second? Thank you. Do I have a motion to waive the reading of the resolution? Thank you. On uh, Tuesday, March 12, 2024, the TGSNA committee, with seven of ten attending, met to discuss this resolution that has been brought forward by the Rules Committee. The background on this matter is that the town's current requirements for giving notice of meetings for, via warnings and agendas is stricter than required by the Connecticut Freedom of Information Act. Currently, we are required to have warnings and agendas submitted 10 days prior to the date of a regular meeting and five days prior to a special meeting. It's not entirely clear as to the original date of these requirements. It's possible that they date from the 1972 code, which uh, is, of course, prior to the internet and emails. Section 1-225 of the Connecticut Freedom of Information Act requires that agenda for regular and special meetings shall be filed not less than 24 hours before the meeting of which they apply. In that, the town's requirements are far more stringent than required by FOIA it's believed that removing this section of the town code will streamline the process and at the same time acknowledge that we are properly operating in compliance with the standards described in FOIA. This opportunity to resolve and improve the situation was called to the attention of the committee by town clerk Krista McNamara and endorsed by her office. After reviewing this background material, the TGSNA committee unanimously approved resolution 2416 and recommended its approval by the full RTM this evening. Thank you, Frank. Um, any other reports? Okay. Anything from town officials? Members of the body? See none? Electors of the town? Looks like we're ready to vote. All those in favor, please rise.
Item 2415 passed 72 in favor, one abstention. No no's, no abstentions, okay. Next item on the agenda is 2417, revision of code section 2307A, election to the Board of Ethics. Speaking on behalf of TGSNA, Frank Kemp. My name is Frank Kemp, uh, District 4 Chair of TGSNA. I move RTM Resolution 2417, a resolution of the representative town meeting of the town of Darien to provide for an amendment to Section 2-307 of the Darien Code. Is there a second? Do I have a motion to waive the reading of the resolution? Thank you. On Tuesday, March 12th, uh, 2024, the TGSNA committee, with seven of ten attending, met to discuss this resolution that has been brought forward by the Rules Committee. The background on this matter is well described in the packet that we received uh, for this meeting. This amendment has been prepared in response to the difficulties that we recently encountered during an election to fill a vacancy on the Board of Ethics. You will recall that when there are three or more candidates for the office, it's unlikely that any one of the candidates will receive a majority of the votes. In this case, there were multiple ballots extending over three RTM meetings with no uh, definitive outcome. In an effort to resolve this situation, should it occur in the future, this amendment to Section 2-307 will require that the candidate receiving the least number of votes will be eliminated from the election and the process will continue until a candidate receives a majority vote. In this situation we recently encountered, there would have been two voting sessions, the first with all three candidates, then the second with two candidates with a successful candidate uh, elected by a majority. The committee discussed this, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of this method of proceeding in comparison to having a plurality vote in which the candidate receiving the most votes among the three or more candidates would be elected. After due consideration, this method, that of dropping the candidate with the lowest count and rerunning the election, was favored. After reviewing this background material, the TGSNA committee unanimously approved Resolution 24-17 and recommended its approval by the full RTM this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Well. Progress in two places here. I think that's just great. Um, are there any other reports on this? Okay. Um, any remarks from uh, officials of the town? Anything from the body? Seth. Yes. Jim Cameron, District 4. Um, also chairman of the Board of Ethics. I cannot emphasize enough how important this election process is you are drawing from your own members people who will be potential judge and jury of ourselves and our town officials. So I have a question for you, and it's somewhat of a hypothetical. We're looking for, uh, we're looking for a majority vote. If we have a meeting with 51 members of the RTM in attendance, a quorum, what is a majority of a 51-member body? Uh, a majority is um, is it 50 percent plus one of those present and voting? Okay, so you're talking about 26 people. If we only had half of our members in attendance, 26 people electing somebody to the board of ethics. I'm wondering, and I'm open to discussion with uh, with uh, Mr. Kemp from TGSNA, if a supermajority 
might be a more appropriate threshold given light attendance in a situation like that. What would a supermajority be in a case like that? That would be two-thirds usually, but Frank, do you want to do this? Or I, I could I could ask town council as well just to confirm, but a super would be a two thirds. The topic of a super majority was not brought up until this meeting, <laughs> and so if there's an amendment, we'll see if our, it's supported. Seth, Seth, Seth. Somebody else. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Ed, wish I could no, come on, Ed. Because <laughs> you can't hear from back there. Ed Washeka, hey. District 3. I had the question as to whether a supermajority vote would be required to pass the town's budget if there were only 51 members present. <coughs> no. <laughs> I thought that was Another, good. yes. Uh, Frank Edelman, District 6, uh, so there's no doubt I'm voting in favor of this. I'm just, Frank, I'm curious. What you're describing is basically a multi-round uh, uh, ranked choice voting, and I'm wondering if you would do it in a single round where you just have people rank their votes because that would give you the, the, all your answers in one, one ballot round. What you're describing is ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting. Right, you're you're doing after each round, you're dropping the lowest vote getter. Right, this has been proposed uh, at the state level, and it's been implemented in other states as well. Um, it's the first time I've seen us do something similar in this town, but I think it's fantastic. So I'm in, I'm 100 percent in favor of your proposal, but why not just do it in a single round where you rank you rank the the candidates? Well, it, it, you can you pick you pick all the one votes. And then whoever has the least number of one votes gets dropped out. You just do it in one. You don't have to have multiple rounds of balloting. Thank you. The multiple rounds of, of, of uh, balloting come, uh, come about if you don't make a majority. And the, by dropping the, the, the person with the fewer number of votes, you can get there pretty quickly. So that was the, that was the reasoning behind it. Thanks. So again, I'm going to be voting in favor of this. I don't want to take any more of the body's time, but I encourage uh, Frank you to consider whether ranked choice voting would be an equivalent way to, to execute that election and to do it faster and more efficiently. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, they did debate that. Susan? Susan Marks, District 5, as we discussed in rules, um, what happens with my minority representation? If, the, if there's three candidates and you need a certain party and it's the third person, the lowest number of votes, what happens? Um, that's similar to what we encounter in, in any case with, with a minority representation. The, more, the minority person would get the seat even period, period. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to know that, though. Yeah. Unless there's an amendment to this, okay. Um, looks like uh, no more questions from the body. Thank you. Electors of the town, I don't see any. Are you ready to vote? Okay. All those in favor, please rise. Please stay until we get all the votes counted so I can announce the vote. I have to announce the vote to the assembled group. Uh, 24 16 passed, 72 in favor, with one abstention, no no's.
that's your name. That's your that's your No problem. So uh, everybody, uh, as it turns out, uh, as perfect as my uh, understanding of uh, Appendix B is, 50 is a quorum for this body, 50. That's a quorum, 50, not 51. 51 has to do with majority votes, never mind. <laughs> when you thought you'd heard it all, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, item 2417 passed 71 in favor, one no, and one abstention. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Oh my God, so many hands. All those in favor, please rise. <laughs>